Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real-life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. So hello and welcome back to Careers Unwrapped. I'm your host, Mark Fawcett, and with me today is Camilla Holden Ayala. She currently is camp manager at the PR agency Broadcast Revolution. She's also at the same time events director at Tribe Event Services. She does pro bono work for people like us. They're an award-winning not-for-profit, celebrate, support people entering media marketing and communication. So professionals very much from a black, Asian and minority ethnic background. And as a fun tip for you, Camilla's spirit animal is a laid back llama. So Camilla, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. I think as this is Careers Unwrapped, we're going to start by unwrapping your career by just perhaps asking you to explain what your job is right now, what that actually entails day by day. Sure. So I am currently at Broadcast Revolution, which is a broadcast PR agency. So in essence, we work to get brands broadcast coverage across TV, radio, podcasts as well. And I guess on a day-to-day, it's very much client management, client relationships, creatives, strategy, I think a lot of education. I think broadcast PR is a very niche part of the industry that unless you've had maybe the fortunate opportunities to work in-house or on really big retainer clients, most people don't really get that exposure. So it's a lot of educating clients on what works for broadcasts. And yeah, just really working to deliver great quality coverage. I think that's the main thing at Broadcast Revolution, that quality over quantity that probably occupies the majority of my day. So in an average week then, or a day perhaps, what's the thing that gives you the biggest kick out of the stage you are in your career now? I think really more than anything, it's working on campaigns that move the dial and make a difference for a brand. I think oftentimes... PR is something that people in-house will just want to, you know, we just want to do a bit of PR because we think we need to do it. And I think having the opportunity to really build that relationship with a client that allows you to educate them and show them how we can take it from a 5 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10, that really gives me a buzz. And when you work on campaigns that, you know, allow you, for example, I did work with Target Ovarian Cancer Charity and you meet wonderful, unbelievable case studies that will really make you question your own life choices, your own perspective, your own moral barometer. They'll really have an impact on you in ways that you probably wouldn't have thought you'd 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 feel. I think that's probably the the real big kick that I get having the opportunity to meet so many people and through that work hopefully leave a lasting impact on someone, whether that's, you know, calling on government to make an awareness campaign or, you know, even just giving sometimes people voices and giving them a platform to share their voice. It it really is, I think, a very underspoke a, a part of the industry that's really just not spoken about. It, it you, you it's never shouted about the the benefits that you can get as a person, not just professionally. And what about the flip side of the coin? What's tough? What's hard in this job? I think it's getting harder and harder to get through to journalists. I think you could PRs could probably agree with that from both print online and broadcast I think it was Mark Rack that put out their PR report their 2023 PR report and I think that actually came out as the top thing that PRs were concerned about you know getting coverage and quality coverage at that you can make 100 phone calls a day and you might only book on one interview so I always say if you don't love this for the life of me, I would never understand why someone would work in public relations. It's so high pressure. It's so intense. You've got to juggle a million balls at once. And if you don't have that real go-getter, like we're going to smash the phones today and I might just get two bids, but I'm going to get two bids at the end of the day. If you don't have that love, this job I think would drive most bananas. So I hear from those people that don't share my job or career. And in a time when you can create a lot of content yourself and put it out there, What's the added value that content that's actually with a journalist or with a respected media channel gives you as opposed to just making it easy yourself, creating your own content and pushing it yourself? I think the nuances that journalists and producers have is they know their audience and their readers better than anyone. And I think 
working with them to get that content tailored to their audience will only serve you you and your client and your campaign better I think sometimes we can be really in the zone and be very you know driven by KPIs and what's the ROI for my client but I think if you don't have that mutually beneficial relationship with producers or journalists you know they've got to fill their papers but they've got to fill their papers with good quality stuff and if we're not working with them to deliver that ultimately you won't translate your story to a different audience and I might have a knowledge of the different listeners and people who might listen to different shows, but I think it's really understanding that we're all in this ecosystem together and we have to kind of understand the changes in in the broadcast landscape, the changes in, you know, editorial teams at newspapers, they've all shrunk down a lot from when I first started in the industry. And I think it's that collaborative work that fundamentally will deliver a piece of coverage that will speak to a client's customer. And so while you're doing this, intense, full-on, creative role, you find some time to do the work with people like us as well. Perhaps give us a little bit of why you do that and what it is. Sure. So Broadcast Revolution, where I'm at now, they've been supporting people like us since its inception. I think that's been something that has been really at the heart of Broadcast Revolution. We're here to do good work. And by good, we mean good for people. And I think our mission is to open the door to people who may not have the opportunities that others have. And I think people like us, it's here to address the industry, address the issues that we have in the industry from a diversity perspective, but also just open conversation and awareness. I think sometimes it doesn't always have to be a beat people with a stick. It's sometimes just, well, if we have a conversation and we open this up and we, you know, touch on some of the problem areas or just some of the areas that can be improved, you can make a huge difference to people's lives. And I think people like us, it really just champions conversation. It champions sometimes voices that are really just left unheard. And in an industry that I think it's very archaic in its ways, it's changed a lot since I first started. Some areas are still fundamentally the same. The industry does have a lack of representation. It does have a lack of different socioeconomic backgrounds. And I think that's what we have really tried to do. If you can push organisations like people like us or any others who want to just make a difference in an industry, I think it's a really missed opportunity for a lot of agencies who don't have that forward thinking vision and just the open heart to say, do you know what, we could actually help you out here with relatively little you know, work on our side. It's let's help each other do good sort of thing. So I saw recently report from the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, which is linked to a couple of UK universities, that if the UK creative industries were to be as socially, economically diverse as the whole of the rest of the economy, there needs to be another 250,000, another quarter of a million more working class people employed in the sector, which is actually the same number of the entire creative workforce for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland together. But you said you've seen some differences and some improvements since you've been working in the sector. Could you explain a little bit about what you've seen that is working a bit? I think what has been working is there a lot more conversation. I think like that's the first starting point. You know, if you don't have that conversation, no one's going to know what the problems are. So I would definitely say the conversation is open where once perhaps it wasn't. I think perhaps a lot of agencies or people within the industry have you know, jumped on the bandwagon, so to speak. Perhaps not always the right intentions. I think it is good PR, but how that then has translated into, you know, actually carving a lane for these people who haven't been able to get into the industry or just don't even know about it being an option to them. I think that's perhaps where the conversation has stopped. So I think it's great that the conversation started and we are seeing, you know, people trying to do something. What that something is actually turning into and materialising, I wonder how much it's really moving the dial. What do you think needs to happen to move the dial more? I think, for example, me, I went to a pretty rough state school. Public relations was never a conversation. No teacher would have, that wasn't even in our sphere for anyone in my school. I think starting the conversation around, did you know that public relations might be for you? Oh, what is public relations? Having that conversation a lot earlier when kids are picking their GCSEs, thinking about what college they want to go to. You know, it's not always about offering an internship. I've always said, you can't know what you don't know. 
if you don't tell someone that something could be an option for them, how are they ever going to find that in their peripheral if it just doesn't exist? So I think having those conversations with, you know, year 11s, with college students, before they then kind of go and make their life career decision, like I went and picked my university degree, which was history and politics. This has absolutely nothing to do with my degree. Granted, it taught me writing, but that one can learn from anywhere else. So I think we really need to, as an industry, start talking to schools. We need to start talking to colleges because it's all well and good championing those people from minority backgrounds or maybe lower socioeconomic backgrounds who are already in the industry. Like, yes, let's champion them. Let's push them forward. Let's amplify their voices. But at the same time, we need more of them. So how can we get more of them? Let's talk to them when they're in schools. Let's talk to them when they're in college. And Maybe not everyone will, you know, start turning around saying, I want to work in public relations. But if you can get three or four kids to go, wow, mum, did you know my teacher told me I was really chatty and she said that that's going to be my downfall. But really, if you've got the gift of the gab, you're perfect for public relations. You'll be a great person to jump on the phones and talk to journalists. So, yeah, I would say definitely introduce the option of public relations as a job far earlier. And you'd probably be surprised how many kids from like me in state schools who will turn around and go, oh my God, I actually think I'll be brilliant at this. So you mentioned back at school then. So take yourself back a few years. What sort of advice were you getting from family, from teachers, from other advisors around you about what you should be thinking about? I would definitely say family was much more, you know, go and be a diplomat, go and be, you know, in some sort of international relations. Obviously, I'm bilingual and at that time I was trilingual. So that was kind of like an obvious, well, why would you not go to, you know, try and get into an embassy or having done history and politics and then my master's in a similar type of field, everyone was saying, why would you not? That's perfect. But I always thought it was quite stuffy and not really me. And teachers were very much learn to keep your mouth shut. You're too loud. You're too obnoxious. That's a ridiculous thing to say. You know, it, it, all, all of my ideas, I always used to say, one day I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm going to open a dog sanctuary slash orphanage. That's always been my dream. It's always been on every career goal, every mood board I've ever had. It's always been that. And I was laughed out of multiple meetings with teachers, interviews, careers advisors. They were all like, that's absolutely ridiculous what you're talking about. So, yeah, it was always very highbrow and nothing to do with what interested me or I cared about or suited my personality in any way, shape or form. And what were the other or are the other two languages of your trilingual? French and Spanish. And which one has stayed with you still? Spanish. So my mum's Mexican. So thankfully, I've kept the um, Spanish. My mum was always very hard pressed on making sure that I keep the native language going. So then you went to university, you did history and politics. How did you break into the industry that you clearly love being part of now? So I was very fortunate to go to a lot of world travel markets, which is basically a travel trade fair. And it was there that I met a minister of tourism and that minister of tourism, I just kind of got chatting. I was very, I was that obnoxious little kid that would walk around and be like, hi, nice to meet you. Sorry to interrupt. And it would be, you know, like CEO of whatever or, you know, minister of ambassador for this. And I would just be like, oh, well, how are you? Nice to meet you. I'm Camilla, blah, 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 blah. And we got talking and then I must have said, you know, oh, I'd be interested in public relations because I'd watched Sex and the City with my mum many a moon ago. And there was a character on there that I loved. Whatever it was that she did, I then found out was public relations. But at the time I was like, oh my God, she's amazing. Like the gumption that she has, the confidence, like she's clearly making money from it. And she's got a huge, bold personality. Like whatever she does, I want to do that. I don't know what it is. My mum was like, she's a PR. And I was like, one day that'll be me. And so when I stood in front of this man who was the Minister of Tourism, so a very senior person, I was like, I want to work in PR. Have you got any jobs going? And he was like, yeah, you seem like a you know happy-go-lucky type of person. I'll put you in touch with my colleague. And then he dropped me an email and I was literally on the way home like to the train station, like emailing the guy like, hi, so my name's Camilla. You, I've got passed on your email by so-and-so. Could I jump on a call? And yeah, I just said, I'd love to work in PR. They happen to have a PR assistant role going in their PR team abroad. And then I deferred from uni, told my mum I'm making my bags and I'm going to Mexico. And I got on a one-way ticket to Mexico and just said, here I am. And then I started working in the Yucatan Tourism Board, so a regional tourism board in Mexico. And then, yeah, it kind of just snowballed from there, I guess. So we're pulling together 
pieces of a jigsaw here in a way. So despite influences about saying you should be a diplomat, others saying you should probably just be a little quieter, and at a degree that was separate from this, there are pieces where you're starting as you go through to pick up what you like and what excites you. Even if Sex and the City is an influence that, which is one of the first I've heard on Careers Unwrapped. But we can all take these little pieces as we see them, as we travel through early life, going, I like that, I don't like that. Can there be careers and jobs and roles and things I can do out of that? And how then did you move from working in, in tourism to what you're doing now? What were the steps on that path? So when I was still in Mexico, I was already kind of asking myself, like, right, this, I've got to come back to finish my degree. Like, I have to come back. So there is going to be a cutoff point to this experience in PR. I've loved it so far. What could be the next option? And I literally just used to sit there in the evenings after work and just Google travel BR agencies London. And then through that, and then obviously loads of names were coming up. And I was just Every day, just going back and looking at this agency, looking at the next one, looking at the next one. Who do they work with? What type of team do they look like they have? You know, what type of clients do they look like they have? What sort of work does it look like they do? And then it was only just through going through. And I thought, you know what? I've done travel. I've done travel PR. I really enjoyed sort of, I've always loved the 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 idea of of traveling the world and meeting different people, seeing different cultures. And so I thought, right, this, this is perfect. Travel PR, this is for me. Next step. And then I just said, well, worst case, if I email 100, one's bound to come back and at least on, uh, offer me an interview at the very least. And so I literally was just sending my CV to every single travel PR agency that I could find saying, hi, my name's Camilla, attach my CV, blah, 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 with a little cover letter or a little cover note. And one of them came back eventually, and then a few more started to come back. And I just started to go on a few interviews. And then there was one travel PR agency who offered me the job. And I just said, I, I fudged a little bit on my CV, won't lie. Um, fudged, I, or embellished slightly parts of my CV. And I think it was funny at the time, there were, I had a lot of experience that I, I didn't I didn't know it was experience almost. I'd, I'd, I'd done little ad hoc jobs, you know, with, you know, my mum's friend or a friend's parent, or I'd, I'd done little odd jobs here and there that I didn't realise the skills and experience that I picked up from that was either actually PR or comms or in some sort of way. So I'd had that experience. So technically it wasn't fudging too much, but that then helped me to, you know, bulk out my CV, even though I didn't have oodles of PR experience. I bulked it out with all the, you know, little odd tidbits that I'd done here and there. And then it just kind of just kept going. And then I loved public relations. I was like, wow, this is great. I was like, what is this? And then, yeah, it just kept going. And what have been the real individual highlights on the journey so far? The things that if people are listening might go, actually, that's something I really like the sound of. What have you most enjoyed? It sounds really lame, but the first time that I ever saw my press release in a national newspaper that feeling is like a feeling that you can never forget. I was like, that's my words. I'm basically a writer now. I was like, oh my God, I'm basically like, I'm a published author. Granted, I appreciate I'm not a published author, but in the moment, it was so satisfying. I think public relations, you have to work so hard, so hard. And a lot of it goes unseen either by clients, people, like everyone in general, it goes unseen. And I think that that feeling that I get every time I see a client on the TV or I, you know, I'm watching from the green room, like, oh, they're about to go live, or I'm listening to radio, and in 30 seconds, coming to you after the song, 30 seconds. So when you when you see those 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 big pay, double page spreads in, you know, the S magazine or or you know on Loose Women, and it, it's it's a it's an incomparable fee. It's just like you get such a buzz, and you're like, five thousand calls later, and only ten pieces of coverage, but they're brilliant ten pieces of coverage. And I just think it's that feeling that every time you that's why I say you have to love it. Like you have to love this neurotic psycho industry that gives you so many incredible magical experiences, some bigger than others, but it's that sense of wow, my clients on national telly this morning or open up the telegraph and there's a fabulous two page spread with great journalism and you know all the key messages and spokespeople and content and assets and social that feeling it just reminds you like wow I'm doing I have a really cool job like I've got a really really cool job that I would say will keep me in this industry for a very long time. Well I think that sounds pretty motivating for anybody who's <laughs> listening. What about no journey's really smooth so where have the rocky bits come? 
where have the fails, the embarrassments, the put your head in your hands moments come? I think very early on in my career, it was not having the humility to know that I don't know everything. I think there were moments in my career where I was very, you know, I know it all and it, this, I've basically done something similar, so I don't need. And I think having the humility to say it's okay to not know everything. The stupid person is the one that doesn't ask the question. So I think early on in my career, I definitely had to learn the hard way that I don't know everything. And sometimes you're better off asking that question so that you don't look like a donut. I have definitely had that countless times. And I'd say now it's just on those days where you're juggling five million different things at a time and you're getting no, 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 or you know, something breaks in the news and newsflash, you've got to rearrange your entire schedule of interviews with someone in two minutes. It's those moments that you can really sometimes lose the faith at points. But I think it's reminding yourself that you will have that moment where you see your coverage and you will go, why it was worth it. So yeah, I think those are a lot of the pitfalls that having that desire to keep pushing, keep going. They've definitely thrown me off at points. But I think as you grow throughout your career, you gain the confidence to be humble and then you also gain the confidence to know the result will come at the end. Just keep doing what you know how to do and you'll push through the day and it will all calm down at a point and it will all sort itself out. Like I always tell the guys that I work with, where there's a Camilla, there's a way. I've got to figure it out because it has to be figured out because there's no other option but to figure it out. So take two steps back, have a breather, go outside, grab a coffee, have a cigarette, whatever you need to do, get your thoughts back together and you'll figure out a solution. I think I've had to learn the easy way, the hard way. But yeah, being humble in your early career, it's fine to not know. What's the social life like in your industry, in your agency? Is, does everyone get together? Is it fun? I'd say our agency, we're very lucky, like Broadcast Revolution. I think our founder has set a precedent from the top down to work hard, play hard. We get to play very hard because we work very, very hard. And I think I've been very blessed in that sense in the, in, the, in the environment that I'm in right now. PR, I will always say, the bread and butter is your network, your black book. By way of the game, you need to be out and about. And a lot of the stuff that I've done outside of my nine to five has always come from a random place that I've been at a random moment where I've been like, Do you know what, I'm going to head down to these drinks or I'm going to head down to this networking and it's because of one poor sod that I've turned around, bumped into, and he's gone, hi, are you all right? Start talking. Next thing you know, it's, oh, I do this. Oh, I do that. Oh, what, what do you know? So yeah, there's there's definitely ample opportunity to, to to network in PR. And I think it's part of the game. Like you need, you need to have that network, whether it's for new business, journalism, you know, you never know who you might need at what stage sort of thing. So yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely solid, I would say. PRs are quite a fun industry. And what's the pay like in the business? Again, I'm very lucky that my founder he is quite an anomaly to the industry. So I'm very comfortable here where I am. I would say the PR industry as a whole definitely needs to do something to step up their game. I think junior people need to be more valued, definitely. Obviously, I'm a bit more senior in my career now. So how, how, th how the landscape looks necessarily for younger people in the industry might have changed a lot but from the people I know I don't think it has too much from where I was when I first joined but yeah it's very difficult I would say to really feel like you're monetarily rewarded for where you are. Along the way you'll have developed skills of your own, learned how to progress, how to do a job really well but I guess you'll also have seen other people around you some of whom are brilliant and some of whom are not so. From that viewpoint what are the skills that you think are most important in being successful in PR? First and foremost, I would say be kind. People work with who they like. And there are many, many, many PR agencies in the United Kingdom, many, many of which do brilliant work and can deliver brilliant results. Clients will come back to you because they like you. People will come back to you because they like you. And I think, especially in such a high-pressured industry, it's very easy to not be very nice. And that's the one thing that I've kind of always prided myself on. You have to be nice. You have to just be nice. Everyone's got someone breathing down the neck. Everyone's got to deliver something for someone. So I think that's, that is one of the, the simplest pieces of advice that I could give someone. Be kind. People will work with who they want to work with. 
But I would also say, like, have gumption, like, really go out there and get it. Like, whether you move into a more commercial role at a company, whether you are hitting the phones all day, talking to media, you, you need to have that real zest and, and desire. Just keep it going, keep it going, have fun, enjoy it so they can enjoy it, you know. It's a real people industry. And if you're not a people person, it makes it very difficult for you to get ahead, I would say. And for younger people trying to break into the industry, maybe those who are leaving school, leaving the university, or in a first job in a completely different sector, you mentioned the number of CVs you had to send out and the letters accompanying them. What advice would you give to somebody who wants to break into the industry now, how they should go about doing that? I would say first and foremost, find something that you have a passion for, whether that's gaming, whether that's you know, sports, whether that's, you know, lifestyle, brands, travel, talent, there is something for you. You just have to go and look for it. And I would say the error I made was knowing what I liked, what I was passionate about, what I enjoyed, but not honing my efforts to get to what that was. I think because people have pressure, people have bills to pay, people also, I think young people, you get out, you're, you're starting to get towards the end of your degree and everyone's like, have you got a job? Have you got a job? Have you got a job lined up? Have you got a job lined up? And everyone's, and you just start panicking because you're like, oh my God, in three months time, I'm in real life. It's not a joke anymore. We are, we're, we're getting into real adult reality. And I think that, that lack of, you know, preparation can force people to just go for a bog standard PR agency that it's not to say there's anything wrong with that, but they might not really care. And I think finding what you're passionate about will then hone your efforts into, right, so I need to find a PR agency that has gaming clients. I need to have an agency that, you know, tailors to what I'm passionate about. And that in itself will make you happier in the long run because you'll be in an environment of something that's that's passionate. So I think even if you don't, you know, enjoy all of the administrative stuff or even if there's parts of the job that you won't like, fundamentally you're working in an arena that tickles your fancy in whatever kind of way. But also I would say have the confidence. I think I unfortunately gained my confidence as I got much later in my career. And I think there are very brilliant young people that don't know how brilliant they could be in public relations. I know so many kids from my school who were had the gift of the gab. They could flog you a broken car. They could sold, sold you a pen when you didn't even need the pen. Like... Those people thinking now in the job that I'm in, I'm just like, oh my God, you would have been amazing for this. Like, why why are you an accountant in Reading? Do you know what I mean? That's that's not you. You could have done wonderful things in the PR industry. So I think have that confidence to go out and get it. There are younger people becoming even more successful in even younger age. And just don't give up. Like, don't give up. There, it, it, it can be jarring the, the first, you know, initial six months after you come out of uni. It's like, where is my life? What is my life? What am I doing? Like, I'm going to, you know be homeless in two years of I've not pennies to my name nothing to do do you know what I mean so I think yeah just really be relentless like keep keep, call, keep sending that email call the PR agencies my name's so and so I've got this experience this experience and you'd be surprised like there's a lot more people who are getting into the industry that have that same opinion of you don't need to be a uni educated student you don't have to sound a certain way you don't have to have certain experiences there are more and more people getting into into those decision maker roles so if if you call 100 agencies one of them is bound to ring you back and offer you an interview and I've always said like the minute you get the foot in the door I'm in the door worst case scenario you don't open the door again all right but I've got in once so that in itself you're already a step ahead of all the people who didn't get in the door so if you don't ask you don't get and I think we're now seeing a generation of I'm gonna ask and I'm gonna get one way or another and I just think If more young people just really went for it, like, worst case, they say no. And you're back at square one. So you say there about more young people going for it. It's really obvious to me that part of your success has been sheer hard graft and determination. It's been one piece of the jigsaw. But we also read in the media about this balance between hard graft and well-being and quiet quitting that was being talked about a lot over the last two years and and even very recent TikTok trend around lazy girl jobs. And where do you see a balance here between hard graft and putting in the effort and the hours and the well-being side of life and getting that right? How do you approach that? 
I would say I'm probably a very bad example of managing your mental health and then your work just because I do take on a lot. But I would say find whatever makes you feel relaxed. It's all relative. One of my colleagues, he loves going for long cycle rides. Quite frankly, I would find that horrible. So that wouldn't be a downtime for me. That would be like, this is unfun and I'm tired and I don't like this. So to me, I actually love sitting down and getting really creative. And and I'm fortunate that things I do outside of my nine to five are incredibly creative and grand. And, you know, you're allowed to go into your zone and just get lost in Alice in Wonderland and start thinking of all these weird and magical things. So I think that is what has helped me in my situation really manage that I'm going crazy slash I'm all right and I've got my head above water and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. But I would say it depends on each person. You just need to carve out time, at least 15 minutes a day. Reading makes me feel calm. Great. Read for 15 minutes a day. You know, cooking. Make sure you take time to make yourself dinner every day. Don't just make a ready meal because you're strapped for time. No, carve out this because it's what makes you feel better. And I think if you're just really dedicating a little bit of your day to something that makes you feel happy, calm, relaxed in your zone, in your vibe, that can only set you up in good stead for the next day. But I I don't know, like I said, I'm I'm a bad example of this one because I will always say to people like, the harder you work, the more more you will get from that, whatever it is, even if you've got, you know, you think you've got a crummy little Etsy shop and, you know, no one's going to care. They might not care now. They might not care in two years. They might not care in five. But if they care in 10 and you then become a millionaire in 10 years, I bet most people would wait the 10 years to get the million pounds. And I think a lot of people, they're very, well, I'm not going to get the result now. I'm not going to get the benefits now. So I'm just going to hold off. Go for it now. Why wait him? Go for it. And I think that what seems to come across clearly as well in conversation with you now, but others, there is a big difference between the hard graft that gives you a buzz in work that motivates you as opposed to the hard graft in work that feels like a slog or maybe bores you. And the effects that both types of work have on you is, is vastly different according to what you're getting out of it. That You mentioned your current boss, the founder at Broadcast Revolution. And I'd just be interested in other people around you during your career journey. What people at what stages have done something, whether they knew it or not, that has really helped you? I think in my first, in my first agency, will remain nameless but I remember at that first agency there was there was a woman there was a a younger at the time she was like what 25 26 or something and she was an account manager there and I remember she used to ride me every day like she was so hard on me she was really unnecessarily just not very nice we then ended up having a conversation about a year later and we were all fine but I remember she was so nitpicky on stuff at the time I was like you're just being pedantic like this is not a and then I now find myself saying the guy to, saying to the guy that I manage, like, it's not aligned. It doesn't look neat. You know, it's, it's, it's so, so I think there's a lot of people in my career that I can look back and go, those annoying things that really used to miff me off when you used to just keep having a go throughout the day about X, Y, and Z. I now see and understand. It's like the things that your parents say to you when you're younger. When you're young, you think they're idiots. But as you get older, you go, oh, well, they have a point. I think... You, Every single person has probably met countless people throughout their career who have said annoying things that five, 10 years down the line, they go, she said that for a reason. And I am now feeling the effects as to why she said this for a reason. So yeah, I would say countless in that sense on the little nitty gritty stuff, like make sure the paper's aligned or whatnot, whatnot. But I would say I also had people, so there's a woman called Kate McWilliams. She she was so lovely and she really took me under her wing and I think she was the first bo- she was the first manager that I'd ever had that had really showed me that you can have a personal caring relationship with someone and we really built that rapport and I think because she made me feel so comfortable with her on a personal level I was then able to grow as a professional because I was able to say to her look Kate I've, I haven't got Scooby what's going on I'll be honest I need your help and then she would coach me through the situation and really take the time to explain to me but I would say probably the person that's had the most influence on my career from a public relations perspective was a woman called Natalie Adams, who I worked with when I was working in-house. And I just remember in my interview, I'd always felt like a bit of a weird duckling at all of my jobs. Like I maybe didn't speak the Queen's English or my background growing up was different or I just always felt a little bit left out. And I just remember in my interview, she, I had acrylic nails, she had acrylic nails. And instead of asking me anything to do with my CV, she just goes, 
your nails are fabulous. And I was like, your nails are fabulous, Natalie. Thank you for speaking to me like human. And this was for a very corporate job. And we had an HR person sitting in. Like, it's the only time I've ever had an HR person sitting in. And it was, she was standing there, you know, very like, I can't believe she just said this. But I think that was the first moment and that I ever thought, wow, I could have a friend and a boss. And I could actually enjoy working with this person. And I remember when I asked her in the interview, what's progression like? And she said, I'll be honest, there's no progression because if you go up, you're getting rid of me. But what I will say is I will teach you absolutely everything I know in PR. And I think oftentimes, frustratingly, sometimes women, because we've had to, you know, the, the women before me in public relations have maybe had to be very harsh and very stern to get their voice heard or carve out their lane in a male-dominated industry. I think perhaps that sometimes trickle down and set a precedent to more senior women with more junior women. And Natalie really, really showed me that me bringing this young woman into this PR industry and really building her up takes nothing away from me. It will only, one, make me look good because if she does amazing, then that means that I've trained her to be amazing. But she really showed me you can be lovely and work in public relations and you can be a very senior woman in a very senior position, very respected, do brilliant work. And I can help this young woman build herself up as a professional. And I think Natalie, she's someone that I still can, I'll go to Natalie and be like, I'm working on this event or I'm pitching for this new client for my own freelance PR stuff. You know, I've gone to her and said, do, do you like my new logo? Like I've set it, like I will go and ask for her opinion because I really do value what she has to say. And I think that's someone who I will always give a big props to on what I've learned because, yeah, she, she really just showed me, wow, there are women in this industry who don't care if I, if I come up. They don't care if I'm standing next to them. She will push me in front of her, if anything. So, yeah, Natalie Adams, she, she made a big, big difference in my career, I'd say. Um- I love that in amongst that, you've got people who knew they were helping you and did that really consciously. And also some who, if they listen to this, may be surprised that you consider them to have been a help. Everyone adding a bit to the journey along the way. What about barriers? What about the conscious or unconscious barriers you came up against? I think because my sort of experience growing up was very different to a lot of the girls who I worked with, a lot of the people who I worked with. I think I always felt, I really did feel like the odd one out. I felt very alone oftentimes in my job. And I think we don't appreciate how much time we spend with our colleagues. Like, gosh, I speak to my my boss about my relationship problems. Like, we're with each other so much that I think we, we miss that. So I think that really did have an impact on me. And there were points where perhaps I could have bailed on the industry. So I was like, well, people aren't really very nice. Like, they're just not really very fun. Like, they're just being a bit mean. So I think that was a huge thing. And I think having the confidence, I really did, I really genuinely did not get the confidence to 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 speak up for myself. And I think I've missed out on promote. Like, I got promoted recently, senior account manager. And that was the second time I've ever been officially promoted and I've been fortunate enough to manage, you know, millions in budgets and, you know, do huge events and huge things. And it, it, it was funny when I got the promotion, I went, wow, this is only my second interview, my second promotion, Phil. And he was like, really? Oh. So I think having that lack of confidence, I think I missed out on a lot of opportunities. Obviously, thing, things work out for whatever reason. But, you know, I, I really think that was a huge barrier that I put myself, like put, I put on myself, I think. I, by nature as a person, I, I don't really care about barriers. Like I'm going to punch through it as hard as I can. But I think I put that barrier up for myself where I was like, oh God, I don't want to say anything because I don't I don't want them to think I'm you know, causing a problem. And I think so many people, you put out the barrier for yourself because if you have that gumption to go, I can care less about this problem or you know, if someone putting this this in front of me or blocking me on this. If you don't care about those things, the only other barrier is yourself really because like I said before, what, what's the worst thing you can say? No to whatever it is. Okay, well, we're back at square one anyway, because you said no at the start. So I think, yeah, that that's a big barrier that I now find myself saying to the junior guys here who have so much gumption and they're young 22-year-old girls who are like, excuse me, I have an opinion about this. And I always say to one girl here, like, I always say to Tanya, I wish I'd have had the confidence that you had at your age. I wish, I, I wish I'd have had that because... You know, I'm not saying I would have my my career would have been wholly different, but I think I could have experienced a lot more things. And if you're looking ahead now, and lots of people define 
career success in many different ways, different things that matter to them. What for you is going to be a successful career? What do you want to do? I think definitely probably building up my freelance work to a point. Obviously, I, I run it under my own agency, Chatty Gal, but I think building out Chatty Gal to really, like one of the things I'm working on now, going back to what we were speaking about earlier, it's we will be going into schools to do workshops and I am literally planning to go to the top five most, I say top, but the basically the worst socioeconomic areas in London and I'm in the process of basically setting up a, a workshop series where we'll be going into schools to talk to them about PR and what is it like. I just think back to so many kids that I went to school with and I'm like, you lot would have been so amazing in this industry. So I think if I was able to walk into an award show one day and go Chatty Gal has had some sort of role to play in making this room look different, I, I would be, I very rarely use the phrase, but I would probably say I'm very proud of myself because there's a, there's a lot of agencies or, or campaigns or just people that I see do work with brands that speak to the kids that I grew up with, to kids like me, to to the friends that I grew up with. And I always ask myself, I wonder how many of the people behind this are part of this community or how many people even know what what we would care about. Like, or have you just done a Twitter search or an Insta or a trend search or a hashtag search? Or do you know what I mean? Or have you done some ridiculous audit that has told you X, Y, and Z? Like, how many of you really understand the 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 people behind who you're speaking to? And I think if I could do something like that and I could walk into an award show that looked totally different to all of the ones I've gone to for the past 10 years or sounded different, if I could see a, a young girl who maybe says thing instead of thing, I would be like, go on, girl, I would be the first one screaming at the front of the award show. That would make me bloody proud to work in PR. And so when this picture paints out and bear in mind, the obscure motivation that Sex and the City gave you. Who's going to play you in the film of your life? Oh, who would play me? Oh, my gosh. Does it have to be like an actress? Oh, who would play me? Probably in my head, I'm probably thinking Selena Quintanilla, who's like the Mexican singer that I would probably say first. But I would say if I could pick someone, it would be Meryl Streep or just any woman who's got a huge pair on her like I love women who go in and they're kind but just unbelievably confidently fierce I think I love women I think I will always champion any and every woman and I think if I could have a woman playing me that really represented who she was whoever that was is or represented me I think that's something that I would love to see more young girls in this industry and just the creative industry in general like have confidence whether you're like the weirdo who likes I don't know what, like whether you think of yourself as a weirdo or like a geek or a this or that, like who cares? Like, are you a nice person and do you do cool stuff? Yeah, great. Like if I could have someone like that playing me, I'd be like, wow, it's not too shabby for Camilla. But also maybe like a J-Lo, I would love that just because she's Latina and I'll be like, oh, this is amazing. Like I've got J-Lo playing me. How much we look alike, that's debatable. But yeah, I would say any woman with a good load of gumption um, would, would make me a very happy girl. There's a starting brief for the casting agent then at this point. It's been fascinating, Camilla. It's been really interesting and it's been inspiring all at the same time. And and when you describe from where you started out and the different viewpoints you were or weren't getting about the direction you've taken up, it shows a combination of, of both skills of attitudes of determination. And I think why not achieve that success that you think your career wants to be ahead of you as well? I think one of the things we always try and do is to just keep passing the baton of careers experience along. So I've got to ask you perhaps for one other person who you think his experience would be really valuable for us to hear about and who might that be? So I could probably give you a very, very long list of people because I'm very fortunate to have a lot of people in the creative industry. But I would say there's probably two two people one a friend of mine who went to university she owns several businesses now and she's done really well a young girl called Stacy she's you know really really killing it but also someone that I would say that probably on a personal level is really really pushes me on a daily basis career-wise to just I'll have an idea and I'll be like yeah that's a great idea why wouldn't you do that and I'm like no but x y and z or x y and z there is a young guy called Kieran Spooner and he has been working in the music industry since he was, I want to say, about like 16, 17. I'm showing his age now, but he, he's, been a, he's been in the industry about 10, 12 years. 
And he originally, he worked with Stormzy before Stormzy was Stormzy. And obviously Stormzy went on to have his career and whatnot. And he is someone who I have never seen someone be so blooming relentless with. I will get into a label. And, and then when he got into his first major label, he had a tweet from three years before and he said, mark my words, in the next year I will be at a major label. And I just remember his post, he said, it might not have been within a year, but I'm here. And he said, I will get into him. I will get into it. I will get into it. And he was sending A&R reports to every single A&R person that he could possibly find. He got an email. He replied in 30 seconds. Someone asked him a question. He replied on WhatsApp instantly. He made himself so unbelievably indispensable that any person that came across him, I've never met a person yet to date that can fault his work ethic. And I think also being in, in such a relentless industry like the music industry, there's the music industry and there's the music business. You can be an artist or you can be someone in the music business. I think to keep grafting and, and I think when I hear people who speak about him who perhaps may not know that I know him, the feedback that people say about him is a testament to his character and I think that graft of just, I might be a bit older than all the rest of you trying to get in and, and he is a little bit older than, than the other guys who are maybe getting in their foot in the door a little bit earlier but I have never seen someone if I've said if I called 100 agency he's called every single head of label head of marketing he'll go into accounts team and say have you got something going and I think that 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 presence of, of his work ethic in my life has just made me go that email that I was going to put off till 7 a.m. tomorrow. Why am I not sending it now? I'm just standing here like a melon. I might as well get it out of the way. That, if more people had that work ethic, and I and I always believe if you just keep grafting, it will come where it comes. Like Lizzo, she blew up at, what, 31. Gary V, he gave his business back to his dad with no money on the bank. He was not on any paperwork. And Gary V, what, gave that back at 30 with no, not a penny to his name. He now owns Vayner Media and is like a billionaire, like, and he's 45. Like, you just have to keep going. And that's why I say if you find your passion, and Kieran's passion was music. I love music. I will always love music. I love rap music. I'll always do it. And, you know, he's now managing an artist, consulting, doing very well, and he, he earns a very nice amount of money for one day's work. Like, and he's earned that. He's grafted. And I think that's someone who has made a big impact on all of our lives that have kind of in his space. They've really seen the benefits of that graft. Well, they sound like exactly the sort of people we need to speak to. So thank you so much. And I was struck also by what you said earlier in this, that where there's a Camilla, there's a way. So thank you so much for helping us unwrap your career. And it's been great having you on. Thanks, Camilla. Oh, thank you, Mark. And honestly, I think more things like this, if we just open the conversation, I think you guys are really doing an amazing thing for young people. I think honest conversations without all the fluffy stuff in between that will get people a lot further so yeah thank you so much for having me mark i really appreciate it thanks this podcast is sponsored by we are futures to find out more about we are futures and how we can introduce your brand business or organization to the mass markets of tomorrow visit www.wearefutures.com Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.